we now bring to you a panel discussion on future of livelihoods in sport safety and worker security in light of the lockdown restrictions as a result of the covid-19 pandemic the panel will discuss the future of livelihoods of athletes and that of support staff in sport they will discuss athlete health and safety concerns upon a post covid return and the importance of player unions and social security after retirement the panel will also look at the conditions of the often forgotten stakeholders of the sports ecosystem such as ground staff security and housekeeping staff comprising mainly informal workers and the key issues they face our panelists are miss nisha milit olympian and arjuna award winner she won more than 600 gold medals in her swimming career and she represented india at the 2000 sydney olympics she is currently the director of the nisha milit swimming academy mr brendan schwab executive director world players association Mr Saurabh Bhattacharjee assistant professor the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences where he teaches courses on labor law and law and impoverishment Mr Som Dev Dev Varman former tennis player Padma Shri and Arjuna award winner Commonwealth Games and asian games gold medalist and the moderator of the session krutika ns researcher at the sports law and policy center she has written articles for leading publications such as the hindu and the wire due to unforeseen circumstances mr harsh mandar who was originally slated to be part of the panel won't be part of the panel today and if you do have any questions during this panel do type them in to the q and a box below and our panelists will try to answer some of them over to krutika and the panel thank you so much shan i hope you all can hear me and if you can't just please raise your hand so that will make it easier great uh, thank you all for joining us today and thank you to all our viewers especially for tuning in during such trying times so diving straight to the panel i'd like to begin with a short introduction back in 1898 leo tolstoy in his famous essay question or uh, the essay was called what is art and i'll dive straight into why it's relevant to us so he questioned why art is so important that hundreds and thousands of people spend their entire lives sometimes even starting from childhood completely dedicating their entire lives and bodies to the world of art itself he went on to specify that uh jewelers and sculptors and artists and carpenters just waste away their entire lives to a structure they're never going to be recognized by. now perhaps in the year 2020 we can pose the same question to the world of sport why do so many people caddies ball boys ball girls even athletes spend their entire lives and dedicate it to a structure where they may or may not be recognized and may not even be adequately compensated for now when tolstoy questioned this his larger question was to go into the essence of art itself what is good art but in today's discussion we're not going to question whether sport is important the fact that all of us have congregated here today in the middle of a global pandemic just shows us that sport in itself is relevant and important but what we must question 
is whether sport and the sporting structures of today adequately compensate for the lives that are dedicated to it. So just to drive straight in, uh, I'll be dividing the discussion today into two primary parts. We understand that athletes and coaches are laborers in themselves and they do perform work. And we do need to address that in light of the changing circumstances during the pandemic and after. But what we also need to look into are the lives of the much more invisibilized people in the sporting structures. These can be people like our caddies and our ball boys and ball girls. So how does sport compensate for these lives? So to start off, I'd like to ask Brendan to just kickstart the discussion and just let us know what's the current state of play right now? How are athletes dealing with the crisis? How are coaches going to be compensated? And how are the other workers often ignored going to sort of deal with this crisis and the many months and probably years after? Uh, thank you, Kritika. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Well, the World Players Association represents some 85,000 athletes through about 120 player associations in over 60 countries. Some of those are global unions like the Federation of International Cricketers Association. I know India is a big cricket country and also FIFA Pro, which represents uh, soccer players. But we're also part of Uni Global Union, which is the global union federation for the services sector. And so therefore we are part of the broader labor movement. And uh, what I would say is one of the great learnings of the COVID-19 pandemic is the development of this notion of the essential worker that um, before the crisis hit, a lot of the work that was precarious and undervalued, be it work in care, be it um, in grocery stores, be it post and delivery, a whole lot of the work that was, was, was becoming more, cleaning, for example, um, was becoming more and more precarious, more and more lowly paid, uh, more and more difficult for people to be able to undertake in a way where they could have what we call decent work so that they could provide for a good life and, and a sustainable life for themselves and their family. Um, hopefully the impact of the pandemic has taught the population at large to respect this work. Um, and not just for the period of the pandemic, but on an ongoing basis, if there is to be a profoundly positive legacy from COVID-19, is that everyone values the work that everyone does, that every person is entitled to dignity and respect. In relation to the athletes themselves and sport, um, and this is also an issue which is true of the broader society. What the, what, what the pandemic highlighted immediately was the lack of liquidity in the economy and in the sports system. And so athletes had to very quickly try and come to terms with two very powerful forces. One was a public health crisis, which we knew very little about. And the other was the devastating economic impact of the shutdown. Now, um, in order to deal with those things, uh, it's clear that the player associations, which were the strongest, the player associations, which had um, the more power, were the ones which were in a stronger position to uh, negotiate a reasonable economic um, uh, adjustment for the terms of, of, of the pandemic, uh, and also make sure that the health-based information was accurate. What we did as a World Players Association in response to the pandemic was to convene all of our unions and develop what we, what we called a set of guiding principles so that we could start to negotiate our way through the pandemic. And one of those critical guiding principles was that public health comes first. Now that might sound self-evident, but you may remember that in the early part of the pandemic, the International Olympic Committee, for example, was insistent that the games would go ahead in Tokyo. Um, and the athletes made it very clear to us that um, it is wrong for sport to exacerbate the pandemic, that sport has a social role to play in setting a standard 
of how industry and society should respond to this unprecedented um, crisis. Um, another very important part of um, those guiding principles was access to the best public information. And so there needs to be an underpinning respect for human rights. We saw the incredible courage of the doctors who became whistleblowers in China, some of whom actually lost their lives because of the pandemic. And we were told as athletes that, including from the International Olympic Committee, that this is a virus which only affects old people, that young people will suffer nothing more than flu-like symptoms. Um, and this was uh, in the very early stages. The knowledge of the pandemic or the, or the disease, we should say, COVID-19, was very limited. We're talking in March. The disease was unearthed in November. So it's only five minutes, uh, five months later. So we had to get access to our own doctors, our own medical people, who could then enable us to negotiate from a position of strength in order to protect the health of the players. So what that means is that those workers and those other people who can't access such top quality information, they were in a very vulnerable position. And so while some of the athletes in the strongest unions are bringing in world-class medical advice, world-class epidemiologists to negotiate these issues, some of the precarious workers are trying to negotiate access to the PEPs. They couldn't even get masks. They couldn't even have places to clean their hands. Uh, some workers weren't entitled to sick leave. And so the impact was, 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 was devastatingly different. And that's why we see, for example, such shocking death rates in, for example, care facilities where uh, people were not protected, people were not represented well in comparison with the athletic population where some have been able to be represented at a world-class level. But even, of course, I must say that the experiences for the athletes are very different indeed. Um, where are we now? Um, of course, we're now seeing sport resume. Um, the capacity for sport to resume very much depends on the surrounding public health situation in relation to the pandemic. And that varies greatly from country to country. In New Zealand, crowds are back. They're playing in front of crowds again. Uh, I'm here in Switzerland. The games are resuming without fans. In Australia and, um, and, and, and in various leagues there, um, games are resuming without um, fans. And in North America, we, we, and, and we are obviously seeing uh, troubling statistics, so it's becoming harder and harder for sport to resume. Um, I would just um, probably finish with the following points very, very quickly. The real challenge now is... Um, to get the return to play protocols right. And we would say, generally speaking, they seem to be very strong when it comes to measures that prevent the uh, introduction or the spread of the virus within the athletic population. But we still know so little about the virus that we remain acutely concerned about the impact of it on athletes who may actually contract the illness. We have seen deaths in young people and remember, this is a virus that attacks the lungs, it attacks the organs, uh, it causes blood clotting, and an athlete needs to be able to recover health to an elite level so that they can resume an athletic career, not just return to uh, an ordinary level of, of functionality. So we'll have to monitor this very, very closely. And of course, the other big issue which I'll finish on is the economic impact. Um, again, the economic impact for some industries will be, will be devastating. I think for sport, it will be for many years. We've gone through a shutdown now, but the, the economic response will be interesting. And again, the more powerfully represented the players are, I think they will be able to negotiate for a longer economic recovery. Therefore, the economic impact can be smoothed over a longer period of time, if that makes sense. Whereas I think those that are more vulnerable, the workers that aren't well protected, we could unfortunately not only see a return to the precariousness we had before COVID-19, but we could see businesses opportunistically take advantage of the very vulnerable positions that people are in because of the pandemic and actually worsen the situation. 
So we are at a, a, a very significant fork in the road. Um, and obviously I work in the player association movement. I work in the labor movement. It's very important that people's rights are respected, that people have good representation. And perhaps the coincidence of the pandemic with the Black Lives Matter campaign may also create a situation that people's rights do need to be respected, that there is a very important conversation taking place about people's rights. And in that context, we can be opportunistic, uh, we can be optimistic, but we're gonna to have to organize and none of this will happen by accident. We're gonna to have to work very, very hard as a collective to try and realize um, a, a more just uh, future. Thanks, Brendan. So from what I gather from the points that you mentioned is that there is going to be gross inequality with respect to how certain sports respond, because some sports, we have to be honest, are much more supported uh, in terms of liquidity, in terms of labor than others. So I'd just like to take this to Nisha, who uh, currently trains many of Olympic swimmers for India. And uh, the pandemic has hit us at a point when not only swimmers, but almost all the athletes were gearing up for the Olympics. Now, as Brenton mentioned, there is going to be some sort of, um, as some people aren't really going to know whether the Olympics happen in the first place, but at the same time, they also want to practice and train. So in this regard, how do you balance public health and health of players with the need to get back to training so that they can secure their livelihood? I think it's a very unique challenge with swimming, uh, only because, you know, in Karnataka, where we are from, uh, all other sports have been allowed to resume because the numbers haven't been that alarming as of now. So every sport other than swimming and gymnastics, sadly. So, you know, our athletes who already were, you know, fighting to stay up in the top 100, we have a couple of boys in the top 100 in the world. Uh, they have not been allowed to swim now for four months and it doesn't look like, you know, with the numbers increasing now and India being in this, you know, very precarious stage of, you know, where now there's community transmission, it looks like pools won't open for another couple of months. And uh, so I think as swimmers, you face a unique challenge because athletes, there's only so much you can do to replicate what you're doing in the pool on land. Of course, you know, every athlete from the junior kids who are eight, nine, 10 swimming, you know, to represent their state, right up to the Olympians who've qualified and done their B qualifying for Tokyo. Uh, everyone is doing a lot of fitness. They're working on strength and conditioning. They're working on mental health, you know, mental training. And that's pretty much all they can do right now because, you know, replicating training on land is something that we just, that just cannot happen. Uh, so as I think, like you were talking about the industry not being well represented, the swimming and coaching and teaching industry as well uh, has not been represented at all because, you know, the government seems to think that everyone's just running these public pools, which, you know, which we have 200 people jumping in uh, and it's like a free for all, you know, everyone's coming to have a little bath. They don't think of it as an industry where people have uh, livelihoods to worry about, you know, the fact that so many people are losing jobs, swimming pools have to shut down. Uh, you know, through this, we've had to keep our pools running because, uh, uh, you know, removing water from the pool is, uh, is much more expensive. So we're keeping the pools running. We have high maintenance costs. And, you know, there have been lots of studies world over which show that uh, chlorine is actually one of the best disinfectants. So in terms of uh, a playing space, like, you know, say you're on a soccer field and there's a lot of contact, in swimming can be avoided where we have, we all swim in lanes, you know. So if there are eight lanes in the pool, you could put eight swimmers in a lane. You have chlorine, which is a great disinfectant if you maintain it to the correct level, which most academies in India do. And uh, the other thing is that, you know, you can just stay away from common areas like changing rooms unless you really need to, and they will always be sanitized. Uh, so the big challenge we're facing here is a lot of countries all over the world, a lot of swimming, uh, the top swimming nations like Australia and America, they are getting back to the pools with these new safety measures. But in India, we don't have that chance right now, and we don't know how long it will be. There's no, you know... Uh, there's no communication from the government, from the uh, from the Sports Authority of India, from IOA, from the Karnataka Swimming Association. So no one knows anything. So it could be three months, it could be a year. So that is huge for somebody who maybe this is their final chance to make an Olympics or, you know, you are in great form already and then you've had four months where you haven't entered the water. You know, uh, we have something called the feel of the water, which you can only get if you're actually in the water. You can be really fit, but unless you're in the water training every day, uh, you're not going to, you lose that feel for the water. So it's going to be a long road. Like Brendan was saying, it's going to take at least a year or two 
before I think swimming can get back to where it was, whether it's the athlete or even the academies, you know, trying to struggle to stay afloat. So um, what I found really interesting in what you mentioned is the fact that one of the reasons you think it's so difficult is because sport isn't even considered to be an industry. So yeah. I, I'd really like to ask uh, sort of his uh, views on that because I think Mizoram has recently accorded that status to sport and whether that's going to help. But just before we dive in, I'd just like to get Somdev's um, reaction on what Nisha said. So do you think uh, tennis is doing any better on this regard? We've seen the infamous Djokovic scandal because of uh, the recent uh, tournament. But apart from that, how is Indian tennis geared for uh, sport in the near future? Um, yeah, first of all, great points uh, from Nisha and, uh, and Brendan. I think, uh, you know, very, very valid. I think, I think what we are what we're all agreeing on is, is that you can't really blame anybody for this, for the situations that have kind of come out of this pandemic. All we are, all we can do and all we can, I guess, ask for is, uh, is how do you have, uh, you know, a group of people that's collectively working very hard to actually get everybody back on their feet in the safest possible way. And, um, I, and I think it's, it's, it's really as simple as that and not to be a pessimist, but just given the track record that uh, I've, I've kind of seen in sport in India, I don't think uh, that we are in the best hands, you know. And, and, and I, I'm simply saying that, in, you know, from, from, from the standpoint of, you know, what, the, the, see, there were, there were many problems that existed in sport before the pandemic, you know. And I'm just saying that now that the pandemic has hit, those problems... We, you know, when we, when we build back, we want to build to a place where we get better, where we get better than where we were. Yes, it's going to take some time, but still we need to lay the foundations where things get better. So, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't mind getting into specifics a little bit later, but I think, uh, you know, I will let uh, Saurabh kind of uh, uh, chat now. But I will say this, that I, I, I still think those problems that existed before are still going to exist later. And unless we actually address them, we're going to have you know, a whole lot of different problems that we can't, uh, that we can't fix. And if we keep depending on the same people who have not fixed our previous problems to now fix our future problems, I think that's short-sighted of us. So it's not a COVID only problem. Uh, Saurabh, would you like to react to that as well as the industry status, whether that could make it better? Right. Uh, thank you for laying down the context, and I think all the three panelists who have preceded me have pretty much given the challenges that are associated with sports and COVID, both the public health crisis as well as the livelihood crisis. But I'll take on from what Somdev just said. COVID has presented a fresh set of challenges, but many of the challenges existed already. In some ways, magnified the crisis of livelihood that exists both within sports for an athlete's point of view, as well as the whole sports ecosystem. A couple of larger points I'd like to make. One, to take off from what Brendan said, we need to understand that right to livelihood and right to safe, secure, and decent work is a basic human right that we expect every person, an athlete, a support worker, a ground staff, a coaching academy staff, all of them are entitled to that. And yet, in the glamour that is associated with the world of sports, issues of livelihood have traditionally not occupied the same kind of attention. And even when it has, we always see it through the prism of very rich elite footballers and cricketers. And we often begin to wonder, should we at all then talk of livelihood in such a context? But we need to understand that sports cuts across a vast categories of sectors each sport having its own unique traits, as Nisha pointed out with specific example of swimming. And we need to be able to have a differentiated approach to different sports, perhaps, because you sh surely cannot treat amateur sports in the same way as a fully professionalized sport. A sport where, which is largely done through national system with national teams and a sport where private clubs and private entrepreneurs are an integral and dominant player. So we need to be able to have that differentiated approach. The second thing we need to be able to clearly have a grasp on 
is the livelihood challenges of those athletes who may not have reached the most elite level they are as far more vulnerable than some of the global sports persons and at the same time their capacity to manage those risks are far limited and given the monopolistic character of sports industry in general their vulnerability become that much more acute while it's true and we have to repeatedly affirm that sports persons are workers and their rights as workers must be foregrounded it's also true that sports persons in many ways are far more vulnerable than traditional worker given that you may have a limited set of employers which means your bargaining power is severely compromised the fact that you have a very short career unlike a professor who may work till the age of 65 also means that your capacity to resist work or pull away from work in the form of strikes that other workers can do is very limited for sports persons from that angle the risks of injury the risks of other health issues also makes them far more vulnerable so that's one that we need to acknowledge the second is once we move beyond sports persons with respect to support staff the other workers who are part of the sports ecosystem are often working in extremely precarious conditions of employment often in no formal formalized mode of employment often the work is outsourced which makes them so much more vulnerable even establishing a relationship of employment can be a challenge and forget speaking of responding to special challenges like covid even some of the most elementary employment rights that we expect blue collar workers to have in other sectors are often not available to support workers and more so in india where much like the overall labor economy most of the support staff are in an informalized form of employment so that's one of the thing that we need to emphasize on and as far as your question about recognition of sports as an industry there are two dimensions to it one is from a policy point of view where it comes to tax incentives infrastructural benefits subsidies and others the fact that mizoram has been the first state to do this will make investment in sports sector far more attractive and a range of economic benefits would come along with that but as far as labor rights of workers in the sports industry goes one still needs to be a little skeptical because it by itself does not change the status vis-a-vis -vis the labor laws i must say however at least in india and in my opinion since 1978 since this major decision which almost all law student who has studied labor law would be aware of the bangalore water supply case it can be argued that sports is an industry for the purpose of industrial disputes act the bigger challenge is to establish relationship of employment bigger challenge is to establish coverage within the social security laws that have been put in place and while india has its own specific challenges i believe many of them cut across global borders that a lot of your traditional social security laws were built around the assumption of an industrial worker now workers in the sports sector don't have the same pattern of employment and then how reasonable and how viable is the same models of social security for sports sector and i believe that there has to be some degree of thinking on it it's not merely sufficient to say that yes they are workers but we have to think in terms of specificity of sport and maybe develop well crafted and tailored legislation that can extend meaningful protection to workers in the sports sector and the other details perhaps we can take on through other conversation yeah thank you uh thanks sora so i'd like to take this to brendan now because what you mentioned is that if at all industry status is going to be given across india there is going to be an increase in investment so liquidity is not going to be an issue but he also mentioned that he is skeptical about that investment trickling down into better labor structures or better livelihoods for laborers who are in a precarious position so why do you think sport operates in such a way that when there are profits the profits are maximized at the top of the pyramid but when there are losses the losses are sort of pushed down to the bottom of the pyramid why doesn't it work both ways well you could say that about business can't you you know um the lack of liquidity we've had a 20 or 30 year period of robust economic growth um increased competition 
opening up of trade. Um, and as soon as this pandemic hits, within weeks, even in a lesser period, um, we've got massive layoffs. We're, 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 and the government has had to come in and pump trillions of dollars into the economy just so that it can function. So clearly the, the, the system is very problematic. One of our guiding principles was strong global governments and remain strong global governance. Uh, but the reality is we're living in a very polarised society at the moment. And it's very difficult for um, people to reach a consensus on a sustainable basis. And it, we've seen in some countries where there has been a political consensus in the early part of the pandemic, that's now starting to break down. And even the science is becoming politicized in some countries. So surely science is knowledge. <laughs> and, and, and so we're in a difficult situation. In relation to sport, the governance is, is very important. So some sports are, run in a very avaricious way. If we look at European soccer, there's strong private ownership. Um, it's a competitive uh, environment, promotion and relegation. It's essential to transfer players. It's essential to get into the European and the international competitions. And there's huge precariousness in, in, in that overall economy, despite the amount of, of wealth that's in it. Other sports are governed on a not-for-profit basis, such as in Australia and New Zealand. And those sports uh, end up giving their elite players a lower share of revenue by agreement, say 30% instead of 50%, so that there is that investment in developing the game. And so there is a whole of game approach. And, and, and the boards that run these games are independent commissioners accountable for an overall vision. And I believe that when the investment is made, those sports will have a competitive advantage because they'll be able to ensure that there's an investment in women's sport, for example an investment in elite de development and investment in grassroots. So governance will be very, very important as well as um, representation. Um, and it will be very interesting to watch. I think women's sport um, and FIFA Pro, the World Players Union has in, in, in issued some very important uh, research on this. There was really, a, it was really a, a, on a, a growing wave. We had 85,000, I think it was, at the women's uh, T20 Cricket World Cup final in Melbourne a world record crowd. Um, Australia's just given, been given the rights to host the World Cup in 2023 after incredible tournaments in 2019. We saw the United States champion for equal pay. So women's sport is on, on, on the way up, but it doesn't yet have the consolidated revenue. And, and so without governance, there may not be investment there. People are gonna have to fight for that investment. The sports at the moment which are best positioned are those with strong, lucrative media rights deals because they still have some revenue coming in when the stadia are empty. And, and absent those strong um, media rights deals, sport is very vulnerable. So governance will be important, I think, and hopefully um, a whole of game governance uh, can, be, can be embraced um, and some long-term thinking to come out of a crisis. Which is, which is a challenge to human nature in many ways. I think uh, Somdev wants to jump in and I actually had a question for him. So uh, according to the panelists from day one, they, in the funding of sports panel especially, they had mentioned that it's actually not about not having sufficient funds because the ministry has actually given back some of the allotted funds to the union budget uh, and the state budget, sorry. So it's not really about not having the money, but not utilizing the money efficiently or effectively. So Somdev, if you could jump in and if you could just let us know if this is a governance issue and whether you have witnessed that firsthand, that might be very helpful to our viewers. Um, yeah, uh, first, great question, first of all. Um, and yes, I do think it is a governance issue. And, uh, and, I, and I'll, I mean, just to make it very simple, um, so I think there was a scheme where, you know, the government was giving out chunks of five lakhs rupees, five, five lakhs of rupees, uh, you know, roughly eight or 10,000 euros or so to, uh, to every kid under the age of, you know, 14 or 16, like something like that to kind of help them in their careers. Now, from the outside, it looks like this is an unbelievable thing, right? Because you're going out there and you're giving each kid five lakhs and five lakhs when you're 14 is... Is a, is, is a boatload of money. 
you know but the problem isn't that they're giving out 5 lakhs the problem in my opinion is that that's the laziest way to spend the 5 lakhs you know because why would you why would you think and, and i'm saying this as a former athlete why do you think a 14 year old and their parents know the best way to spend the 5 lakhs the most efficiently you know so that obviously comes down to governance and you know once again coming back to what brendan was saying i think uh, he I, he absolutely hit the nail on the head um when he said that the people who will be at an advantage coming out of uh this pandemic are people that are going to be you know obviously a little bit more independent and i think you know india for me is very interesting because there's two polar opposites that are very 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 clear for everyone to see one is bcci bcci like imagine if imagine if the bcci had to wait for government orders in order to try and carry things out why is the bcci progressed more than any other sport is because they have independent thinking they have the ability to think long term and nothing really tries to nothing takes them away from their long term thinking so when the when the ipl started it was what it was and now it is what it is but unfortunately i actually don't think and i'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts on this but i actually don't think that the way the current sporting system is set up is actually set up to have a long term vision and simply i mean and and the number one reason i can, i can give you for that is every person who comes in whether it's a sports secretary or whether it's a sports minister and i've worked you know not at you know not at much depth but i've worked fairly closely with 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 uh, with both positions and you know i i will say one of the most problematic things is when these people keep changing positions every two years so a sport a, a person who has absolutely nothing to do with sports will come into sports by the time they understand it uh you know you 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 can you can have discussions and talk about things and 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 present projects and talk about long term visions and how it's going to actually make a difference to the sport but by the time they understand it and they maybe approve it they're gone they're transferred off to the next position and in comes another person and now you have to convince them again so you know this cycle unfortunately will continue over and over again because you you're mixing up sports with uh, political policy or 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 government policy and you know if you look at the sports that do well internationally the government doesn't the government just goes out there and supports the sport but the sport is run independent of what's happening with with everything else and i think india needs to reach a position where every sport runs the same way as the bcci does regardless of who's going out there and winning elections the bcci is still going to go out there and put people in the stands they are still going to go out there and have great events and and i don't i don't see that happening with other sports and 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 it needs to be a long term vision i think uh, sundeep makes a very important point on how changes on top have such ripple effects on just the rest of the pyramid and i i'd like nisha to jump in and uh, nisha you've had experiences with dealing with sport both as an athlete as well as now you run a private academy so how connected do you think is the fact that you are having trouble now with your academy and that further trickles down with the way you pay your employees the way the lifeguards are uh, working right now the way uh, parents are dealing with it and not just an athlete centric uh, view but generally uh, the cleaners of the pool the people who sort of uh, are security staff at your academy you know how are things like that getting affected because maybe you're not getting enough attention from your federation you know i think what somdev said is spot on because uh, you know everyone knows that bcc has done so much for the sport of cricket you know we'd like to complain and say you know olympic sports don't get their due uh, but that's because the federations haven't really done anything like you said we have we've had politicians or you know people in their 70s running our swimming federation for years you know and so one part of it is you know having ex swimmers uh, coming back into the sport and getting into the federation now i'm quite outspoken and that's why i've never been allowed to be part of any whether it's the state or the national federation you know because obviously i'd fight for the rights of the players here it's all about pocketing money sadly everyone knows uh, you know this fact um so to put it bluntly yes if we had people good governance you know bringing in the money making the sport more attractive and then it will slowly trickle down because like you know first of all swimming if unlike even tennis is an amateur sport Uh, so you don't play for prize money you play for a gold medal which isn't even a gold medal you know unless you get an olympic medal uh, so the fact is already it's so difficult for the athlete to even uh, get through their career my parents sold our family house just to support my career 
you know, and maybe in my entire career, I got maybe six lakhs worth of prize money, which is peanuts. They was probably spent close to a crore of their money, you know, so that's what it takes. Now you have an Abhinav Bindra who had access to the funding, uh, got a little help from the Federation, yes, but his dad built a shooting range at the back of his house, which is probably one of the reasons he had access to the best possible facilities and he got us a gold medal, you know. So we're talking about getting to that Olympic medal, we need a lot more professional approach and like you said, because the federations don't do a good job, uh, you know, swimming, there's absolutely no money in swimming. I know the few competitive athletes that we have have now lost their sponsors over this last four month period. And I worked with a couple of brands to get them. And we worked so hard to get these athletes the sponsorships. And, you know, by the second week of the lockdown, they said, listen, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to cancel all funding, including those training for Tokyo, who qualified for Tokyo. So it is just heart wrenching. But going down, you know, from the elite athlete all the way down, uh, what Somde was mentioning were uh, athletes at the Kalo India Games, who won the Kalo India Games, who were, which was a nationwide inter-school competition. The government was giving them five lakhs. And the only good thing about that, and the, what I feel, is that the money went directly to the hands of the athletes. Because otherwise, that same five lakhs, if it came to the federation, by the time it came back to the athlete, would have been pretty negligible. you know. And one of the reasons that there was even some money going into sport is because I think we had an ex-Olympian, Olympic medalist, Rajavardhan Rathor, who was the sports minister. So he understood sport. But like Somdev have said, by the time he could actually put some good policies into place, try and make an effort right from the grassroots level all the way to the elite level, he's not there anymore. And, you know, we have a new sports minister to deal with. And so it is very difficult. I know that the people being affected most by this, at least from what I've seen, are the people who deal with maintenance uh, in pools. Uh, you know, like you said, uh, the athletes come from, you know, uh, different backgrounds. Some of them have the funding to, you know, continue. Most of them have lost their sponsorships, but they still manage. They can still put food on their table. But if you look at people I know in my own academy that uh, do maintenance for us, cleaners, uh, lifeguards, uh, and, you know, some of them, they don't have any other way of earning a living. You know, so we in this period are trying to upskill them. We're saying even our coaches who, uh, you know, we can't really do online classes for swimming. So the only thing they can do is get into the uh, business of maintenance where, you know, pools all over Bangalore are lying vacant, but at some point they'll be used. So we're trying to upskill these uh, coaches and teaching them, uh, you know, how to maintain pools. So we as a business are trying, you know, to provide for our, you know, employees, not just by, you know, giving them a check, but also in the future, things are going to change drastically. We're expecting a good 50, 60 percent loss in, you know, annual revenue and most sports are facing this. Um, so we have to kind of upskill these people, give them that confidence. We have, uh, you know, we need to be trained. First of all, a lot of our coaches and teachers in different sports across India don't have even a basic certification, you know. So, you know, they can't go to another academy where they can get a better pay or they can't go to another country. Uh, so they feel, you know, like sometimes I've actually seen coaches who now work as security guards. You know, they've not had that education. Uh, they or Sometimes they can't afford it. They want it, you know. So I think academies all over... Uh, the federations need to do a lot more in terms of coaching and teaching, education, even maintenance. You know, there's so many degrees that you can get out of the country. But in India, there's nothing. You know, my husband was looking to do one and he managed to find one course over 10 years in terms of how do you maintain and run a swimming pool, you know, and he did it. But they had maybe 10 people in it. So you have 10 people who are certified to maintain pools in India right now. And the rest are just, you know, uh, at this point, they'll say, you know, sports isn't going anywhere. The pools are closed. Let me move on and do something else. Uh, so sadly, they are the ones that are worst affected. And, uh, you know, it's great that we have campaigns like Play for India where they're trying to support the whole ecosystem. And I hope, you know, I know Viren Raskina, uh, part of the hockey movement, they managed to raise something like 22 lakhs. And this will go to all the different states. It will go right from, uh, you know, people who are working on the grounds to, uh, you know, coaching and coaches and teachers who really need it. Uh, so I think it's time also for the public to kind of come forward and support, uh, you know, sports as well, the business of sports. Uh, I just like to uh, get to Saurabh on this. So um, you mentioned the dignity of labor initially and how that's so important across uh, jobs and sport and, and anywhere else. So how do you think uh, caste and gender plays into this dynamic? Do you think it's skewed in such a way that certain jobs are just considered a lot more reputed and the diversity in that job is not that much? For instance, do you think there's a lot more skewed uh, presence of lower castes or uh, lower classes in a blue collar job or like a support worker job. 
but athletes are probably far more represented on a, a higher class side. And just uh, tying that in with what Nisha mentioned, do you think in such a situation, a rights oriented approach will work better in securing worker rights? Or do you think we can just depend on the fact that there are uh, philanthropists and charities that are trying to help you in such things? Mm -hmm. well, that's a, a quite a critical point. At one level, we also need to see what we have found across the labor economy, that there is a preponderance of people from marginalized communities, from so-called low caste, within more precarious jobs, within the most vulnerable jobs. While I haven't come across systematic empirical work in the field of sports per se, my sense would be that a similar results can also be found if a study is done within the field of sports also. And you find anecdotal accounts when you look at Malis and others who work on cricket grounds, you'd often find that yes, many of them would be overwhelmingly from either backward caste or from some of the other underprivileged communities. So that's one part that has to be addressed. And I believe at some level, sporting organizations need to think in terms of greater inclusion and what could be measures that could be thought of both at the level of sports persons, also at the level of sports managers and others, what sort of diversity measures can be introduced. And it's been an extremely contentious debate in the field of private sector employments anywhere in and not just private sector, of course, government sector has had a very fractious history. But I think sports organizations on their own have to think of it. And only area where you can find some amount of work that has been done with sports persons. And you have had people like Ramchandra Guha and others who have written about the number of cricketers who have come from Dalit communities and you would have them on fingertips. And perhaps that gives you an indication of the nature of barriers that exist for people to climb up to the most elite level of a sports. And as far as protection of workers go and COVID has really shown up the absence of meaningful and effective protection for workers within the or across the sports ecosystem. Yes, perhaps sports organizations on their own have to think of measures, whether they raise money through philanthropic donations or they have a, by a larger allocation of their own surplus for some form of pension or other forms of social assistance for workers needs to be thought through. But yes, as you said, we need to perhaps move away from charity to rights. Because if we believe that everybody has a right to decent livelihood, if everybody has a right to subsistence, then we must not rely only on philanthropic support, but must speak in terms of contractual rights of workers. We must speak in terms of rights as citizens also. And while this may go beyond the theme of this panel, but I think the failure to universalize some sort of basic support in response to COVID in India was a grand failure on part of the government. And perhaps all policymakers need to think through whether the fear of recurrence of further pandemics like this actually emphasizes on the need for some form of universal social support. But within the sports sector, yes, perhaps if we think in terms of contract, recognizing contractual rights of workers and having some form of pension, having some form of unemployment allowance, basic income support, go a long way. How much can be afforded? Certainly a BCCI can afford much more than what other organizations can. But there are ways in which minimal support can be developed. And even the government, if you have seen over the last few years, they have introduced some pension scheme. They've also the Pandit Dinda, Lupadhyay, social welfare scheme. Most of them are very limited and they need to be expanded. But I think now is the time to really have a serious conversation on concrete ways of how to expand such protection, both at the government level, as well as at the, within the levels of sports organizations. Though I must sound a note of caution and skepticism that unless there is organization, unless there is some strong representational strength, it's unlikely to happen. Workers' rights did not come through as a matter of gratuity by employers. They came through because of strong organization and mobilization by workers historically. And something similar has to happen in sports. 
and unless that happens i'm not very sanguine about there being strong social security programs for sports persons and other support workers so i think somde wanted to add a point and i think right after we can jump into the audience question yeah sounds good um uh, i think i think you know everyone's been talking a lot of sense at least to me it, 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 you know it, i i really i'm really enjoying kind of what's going on i think just to kind of add on to uh, sorob's point one of the things i would like to kind of you know maybe bring up is obviously while you're talking about worker uh, compensation and worker security um i also think you know we need to beg the question why is it not secure you know and for me the simple answer is is that we obviously as a nation and this is not something i'm proud of uh, it's just something that i feel is um you know the general feel around sport is people don't actually believe sports health and fitness is something that's very important and until we actually do believe that that is something that's very important i don't think things are going to change and just look at schools for example you know i've worked with uh, uh, i i work with a charity that works with schools and i also i've worked with over uh, probably a couple hundred schools uh, doing sports programs for them over the last four or five years and uh, you know you can look at colleges and you can obviously let's not even begin comparing college sporting systems by the way this is my favorite sporting jersey thanks for uh, this is the university of virginia where i went uh, in in the states um but 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 you know the point being uh one of the reasons that i think that you know all of these uh the basic sports in our countries in in high schools is you know we don't have a high school sport, uh, sporting system we don't have a co- college sporting system we don't have an amateur league for people who just go want to go out there and play and so so there's many things that that just point in the direction that that just give you the answer that this is not that important yet and until it is that important i think it's pretty pointless to go out and talk about workers rights because you know no one's really paying attention and the union like saurabh said is not going to be strong enough because there's not enough people and this is not important enough for the general society and and you know unless we so we unfortunately we're talking about something that a lot of the country doesn't care about you know and and that's why we're in a in a position that we're in but obviously people who do care it's just nice to see that they all coming together and still trying to make make this make this matter make this better over the long term uh thanks somdev i think we can move into the audience questions and there's one for brendan from dr catherine odway uh she's wondering how women's sport is going to be impacted in terms of the investment as opposed to men's sport well yeah i think it's a it's a very important question I think that the underpinning fundamentals that were in place in the lead up to the pandemic remain in place. That is that women's sport is being properly valued as uh being equal and elite. I think the athletes are in getting incredibly well organized. and also in terms of say the point that Somdev was making in some countries the social impact and the health impact of sport is understood and so therefore to encourage girls and women to play sport is something governments are prepared to invest in um so i think we have to be mindful of those uh fundamentals um the challenge will be certainly felt commercially um there's no doubt that um the time by which women's sport may be commercialized may take longer uh because there's going to be a significant cut to the traditional elite sports properties um in most countries and so the opportunity for women's sport to get a part of an increasing pie may well be prolonged however i do believe that sport if it plays its social role right will be um and 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 preserves its social license will be well positioned to attract government investment in many countries and there's absolutely no doubt that that investment should be conditional upon being equally applied uh, among men and women sport and indeed you could argue that there needs to be uh not an equal allocation but an equitable allocation which may see more go into women's sport for the reasons 
that, that I've just mentioned. So we just need to maintain our belief that the culture was changing pre the pandemic and remind ourselves uh, of that cultural change um, as we navigate our way um, through the pandemic and in the period afterwards. Um, I think we can go to a question by uh, Shruti Mehta. She asks, do you believe that one reason sport does not get the importance it deserves is because the biggest international development partners like the World Bank have no strategy or directed approach towards investment in sport for develop development? Um, Nisha Somde, would you like to take that? You know, I think like what Somdev said, people don't really care about sport as much. Uh, in some ways, maybe this pandemic can bring about the fact that, you know, a great part of building your immunity is playing sport, staying healthy. So maybe the one positive we can take away post this pandemic is that people have now slowly started realizing health is important. They're also sick of being in their own house, you know, but they've understood the value of working out of the whole family, keeping your kids healthy, you know, so fitness maybe will start slowly taking a higher role. And in turn, you know, it, 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 it's obviously up to all of us as athletes, number one, to get back in our sport, try and make a difference. And I've seen that, which is the only, you know, heartening thing for me. I see so many, you know, ex-Olympians, uh, international players from different sports wanting to stay back, uh, come back to India, even if they are out of the country, and then, you know, give back to sports in India. Because it's really... Like you said, if you have to, if you're, we're all pretty cynical when it comes to, you know, what will the government do? Uh, what will the federations do? Uh, you know, we've waited so many years. We have tried to make a change and we haven't really seen it. So we just have to do whatever we can from our point of view. And, you know, if grassroots level sports can slowly start growing, people understand the value of sports. Maybe that will slowly, you know, help uh, sports being more recognized. Uh, definitely in India, I don't think uh, things are going to change anytime soon. It's going to take a long time. Uh, but there are so many people that have already, you know, from winning just one Olympic medal, uh, you know, we're, we're able to win more, you know, we're able to get to the top 100 in the world. So there is huge improvement in sports over the last few years and a country of, you know, uh, one plus billion, you know, we have so much, uh, so many people are passionate about sports. So don't do it for the money. You know, we're really in it uh, uh, for the love of the game. And, you know, there are people who are even, you know, ball boys or uh, maintenance or lifeguards, you know, the kind of passion that they have is the only thing keeping them in sport, you know. It's so sad. I've seen, you know, people in other academies uh, are, are not even given a proper contract. So at this point of time, they just, people just wash their hands off. Uh, you know, things like the few small benefits that they could get, like, you know, I know a lot of my employees are now digging into their provident fund because we put in that PF, you know, and we have proper contracts in place. Uh, so maybe it's some kind of, you know, laws, some kind of, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the Federation has to take the onus, first of all and lay down these dues because you know in india black money is king and you know everyone's taking in cash so not avoiding paying their uh, you know gst and uh, at the end of the day it's the big guys you know the top of the uh, sports echelon who kind of get away with everything uh, but if you can slowly start regularizing this give contracts to every single employee uh, then they'd feel a lot more secure you know so they have something and i know uh, even this much just two days ago uh, you know my accountant called and said so many of the coaches would like to dig into their pf you know and got the approvals and they did that so at least it's something to fall back on, you know, similarly for the sports people, something where they feel like I can at least make it through the next six months, you know, uh, some kind of hope for the future. So that's, I think, all we can hope for right now. And for the system to slowly change, I think it'll start from the bottom to the top. It's not going to start from the top, sadly. I think uh, we can end on one last question. And uh, Brendan or Saurabh, either of you can take this. Um, what do you see as an aspirational model for sport? So what do you think maybe five years from now after this entire pandemic has passed, what do you think would be a good and sustainable system for the bottom of the pyramid? Either uh, of you. I take that first? So. Sure. Right. Uh, as I said, one cannot have a single answer because sports is an extremely diverse sector. But at the same time, there are a few select examples that one can think of. One is for sporting bodies to voluntarily adopt some form of social security programs. And the example that Nisha gave, you may not 
need to have a very expansive program, but at least some form of subsistence that could be assured at the time of extreme crisis is a possibility that is doable. And I can see what BCCI has done in terms of pension. Maybe some of the other smaller bodies can replicate. And when sports ministry is sanctioning grants to federations, perhaps sports ministries can attach a clause to say that maybe a small sliver of that grant has to be allocated to social security programs for the workers. And I believe that is doable. Of course, there's a catch 22 because with Indian government's involvement in sports, the history has so, so vividly said, hasn't been a very positive one. And one wants to be wary of governmental control. But at the same time, if sports bodies on their own are not taking the initiative, some form of a nudge from sporting sports ministry can help. And I do believe that it's time where the government must allow registration of unions or associations by sports persons. The Supreme Court made it mandatory to have a players association with respect to BCCI. And I believe whether it's through judicial intervention or through the sports bill, which we have been waiting for years, maybe to make a players association mandatory and through small steps, then the specifics can be worked out between the associations and the sporting regulators. Players association then can become an important stakeholder who can then guide the ways in which perhaps the nuts and bolts of social protection can be worked out. Brendan, would you like to add to that? I, I think it's been really well spoken. Um, the I think sport has a great role. I, I, if we look at um, the situation with the kafala system in Qatar, for example, when when Qatar was uh, awarded the World Cup for 2022, there were two great scandals. The first was, of course, the corruption which resulted in the vote, and the second was the appalling abuse of migrant workers in the construction sites in relation to Qatar. Now that inspired a global movement which has seen FIFA um, adopt a binding human rights policy. Uh, that's an example now that the International Olympic Committee has indicated that it will accept. And it's also seen moves to abolish under the guidance of the International Labour Organization, the kafala system in Qatar and surrounding countries. Now those incredible labour reforms would not have been possible had Qatar never been given the World Cup. So it is incumbent upon sport to set the right example. The International Olympic Committee has an important role to play. And India, of course, like Australia, is part of the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth Games Federation is certainly one of the leading federations in championing human rights, which includes freedom of association, freedom of expression, the right to dignity. So um, I, I'm optimistic that, that sport shouldn't wait for government. I think that sport um, can lead. Sport is very strong on self-regulation, but that self-regulation has to be just and it has to be based on internationally recognised human rights. Thanks so much, Brendan. Thanks. Oh, uh, yeah. Somdee wants to add a point. Um, really quick, guys, before we head out, um, uh, just just to uh, confirm, you said like, how, you know, what can we do to kind of grow sport in a, in a long term, right? That was the kind of question. Where do you see sport if it was to be the best form of sport you could see? Right. Um, so I've actually, uh, the, the reason I wanted to kind of just add a, a really quick point over here is because I've thought about this for, for, for years and years and I've kind of worked on it myself. I've seen what different federations in different parts of not just the country, but, but different uh, different countries do in Europe and, and in America as well. And, and, and here's my conclusion. And, and, and this may sound super simplistic. Uh, and I know that it's only one part of the problem, but I do believe it's a major part of the, uh, it's, it's a major part of the solution. And for me, the solution is, you know, the, the easiest way to grow a sport is to have an incredibly good event structure from the bottom up. And I'm talking about an event structure that includes juniors, Amateurs, wheelchairs, Special Olympics, Paralympic athletes, you know, uh, uh, you know, different age group, veteran players, and then the pros. So almost think of it as an event structure that's a pyramid. So your pros are at the top and everything else is at the bottom, under eight, under 10, boys, girls, men, women, every single thing. Now, um, the reason I'm saying this is 
what what this will do is this will obviously increase the number of people that play and if the, if if this increases the number of people that play this will also increase the number of people that work uh so now you're doing two things the other thing that this will do is if you have a the problem now is we don't have a really good tournament structure so inevitably what happens is people past a certain point stop playing now you have to incentivize people to never stop playing the sport once they start playing it like what golf has done you know so um so 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 the simplest thing to do is to have a really really good tournament structure and this is something that we can learn from america look at they have little league on tv can you believe it the number of people that watch little league on tv they have high school sports they have college sports i mean i mean are you you forget about professional sports the ncaa is a multi billion dollar industry and it's all run through college athletes who don't make a penny and i know that's a completely separate argument but the point is they've built a great tournament structure and by you know let's say i i'm a i'm a former player now i've, I've retired i have absolutely no reason to go out there and play tennis other than if i really like to but maybe it would be nice if there was a veterans league and you know a constant 35 and over 45 and over and 55 and over so what happens is people never stop playing the game so that that way your game continues to grow because whoever comes in becomes a repeat customer and continues to play the game because there's always a good reason for them to play the game right now we have a lot of reasons to not play i think that's a very important point so you build a strong yeah. structure for sport and you to yeah. ensure that whoever comes in is treated with dignity so uh, right. thank you so much to the panelists for joining us today and for addressing such an important issue and it's over to shan thank you kritika and thank you to the panel for that engaging and lively discussion